He's trying to break into NASA. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Let's let's not uh, air this. <laughs> You're listening to the Cosmic Cast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Cosmic Cast. And unfortunately, everyone, I am sick today. I know, I know what you're all thinking. The world is a cruel place. But just before you thought it couldn't get any crueler, I'm going to have to hand over to Dr. John Pernet Fisher to intro the episode for us. Thank you very much, Ricky. And uh, well, you know, you, you're a very, very brave soldier for coming in regardless today. Uh, true dedication. Um, well, hello, everybody, as Ricky has just mentioned. <laughs> I'm also joined here by Thomas Harvey. You're right. And this week we've got a fantastic guest. He's come all the way from the Department of Aerospace Engineering, a few buildings down the road. We're joined by uh, Gunther Just. Hey there. How's it going? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. I mean, I think, so you're, you're a first year PhD student. I am, yes. And uh, your research sounds absolutely fascinating. So you're doing a lot of work on resource utilization on the moon. How did you get into this field in the first place? Um, it's a quite... It's a bit by chance, basically. So I have a, a bachelor and master's degree in aerospace engineering. Mm -hmm. um, it was always from, from Stuttgart, Germany, to represent a bit here. Um, <laughs> and I was interested in, in space flight, and I was doing quite a lot of work on, on um, life support systems mm. and did my master thesis with the European Space Agency working on bioregenerative um, life support systems, wow. with, which plays along with that whole issue um, or resource utilization um, research of of uh, bringing as little resources as possible. Mm -hmm. Because I was I was looking at um, how to use algae to produce oxygen from um, basically recycled urine, okay. um, <laughs> wow. which actually the my my group my ex group from Stuttgart they uh, just. They're just about to launch the experiment to the ISS. No, okay. um, oh, so look out for the, yeah. it's called the PBR, the yeah. photobioreactor. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so can't wait. While, <laughs> while working in, in Cologne um, for ESA, so we have this, there's this initiative called Spaceship EAC, which is a lot of um, it's PhDs, master students, interns working on all kinds of futuristic technology. Mm. So it's a bit of, it's a bit like an engineering think tank, <laughs> I would say. Mm. And so there was a lot of work going on um, about ISRU and um, about microwave sintering of regolith mm. and stuff mm. like that. So I got involved, besides my project, got a bit um, involved with some of the other projects. Mm. And by doing this, got really interested into the whole resource utilization um, mm. aspect of, of um, future missions. Mm. And then, yeah, had this had this PhD in mind um, and set out to get some funding for it. And in the end, it worked out and I ended up here in Manchester. Cool. That's cool. So it was very intentional to come to Manchester then for this project. I don't know if I can say that, but <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no, it was, um, it, it was by chance yeah. as well, yeah. actually, because I was, aim I was aiming at a, I applied for an, an ESA initiative where they fund part of your PhD um, and I had my proposal in, in mind. So I was, um, I needed a university that was keen on, on um, collaborating with me mm. and my, my group um, here in Manchester or my now supervisor was mm. very interested in the topic mm. and we got along really well. And then she got Katie Joy on board, which appeared on the podcast before as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, and then it was a really strong, a really strong team. Yeah. Uh, we didn't end up with the money from ESA but still um, were able to secure some funding from the university. That's right. So that's how I ended up in Manchester, but I like it. It's yeah. a good, yeah, it's a good place to be. What is resource utilization? So the whole resource utilization, or we refer to it as ISRU, because it sounds a bit cooler. Um, <laughs> so the full, the full um, name for it is in situ resource utilization, um, ISRU. And I'm just going to say that a million times during this podcast <laughs> just to, to um, get so, it to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, so we want to go back to the moon. That's the, the plan of um, most space agencies by mm. now because the moon is a good, um, it's a stepping stone to Mars. It's a good um, place to, to have tech, a tech demonstration. And also there's still a lot of science to do um, mm. on and around the moon. So um, we want to utilize the resources we have on the moon, which is pretty much only the lunar soil, um, the regolith. 
And we want to use the soil, for example, to 3D print it or to extract the oxygen to enable astronauts to stay for extended periods of time. And my PhD um, research is about how we actually excavate the, the lunar soil because mm. it is not as easy as you might think. It's a very special soil. So the, the parameters or the, the characteristics are, um, yeah, let's put it that way, horrible to work with in <laughs> a, in yeah. a engineering um, context because of very small particle sizes mm. um, is electrostatically charged. So it, it adheres to everything. So the whole excavation part is um, a, a big challenge still. And it's the first step to any process we want to do with the regolith. So um, there's unfortunately a bit of, um, in my opinion, a, a bit of a lack of focus on this part. Mm -hmm. But um, hopefully my PhD can um, yeah, increase our, our knowledge base a bit. <laughs> Very good. So it's really focusing down on some of the technical and mechanical <clears throat> aspects of how you go about digging and all that kind of thing. Exactly. It is um, how we can actually scoop it up because... Yeah. Um, a lot of people think it is just miniaturizing a, a digger yeah. um, and send it to moon. But. Well, this actually links really well to a question that we had in our Q&A episode last week where uh, somebody asked, why can you not just dig to get the lunar samples that you want? Why do you have to wait for large impacts to sample stuff that are deep down? And I guess... I guess as, as, as in general, there's sort of a lack of appreciation of how difficult it is to do very sort of basic digging activities mm -hmm. and drilling activities on a body that has no atmosphere. Mm. Yes, so basically there are, so, um, there are two main problems we have in, in terms of excavation, besides um, the moon being a, a body without atmosphere, so we're operating in a, in a hard vacuum mm. and um, have large temperature differences. But the two main problems we have is, uh, on one hand, the the properties of the lunar soil, as I just said, um, and the digging deep is actually a, a big problem mm -hmm. because the regolith is, um, if you see it, see it on TV, you always see the top layer that is this super fine powder and it goes everywhere, yeah. which is actually one problem as well because <laughs> we, we don't really know yet how to deal with all the dust. There's, yeah. one, there's one good example of the, um, the lunar rover that the Apollo astronauts had, which um, after three days stopped working because one of the radiators was completely yeah. covered in oh, wow. in yeah. regolith and yeah. it overheated yeah so but now we're talking about staying on the moon for extended periods so we have to figure out how to um have reliable technology yeah. that can deal with the the um the environment yeah i think it's an underappreciated problem I and mean, also i guess as well there are a lot of famous uh, shots particularly from apollo 17 of astronauts when they were they're back in the lunar module without their helmet and they're just like caked in dust yeah. and, and mm. stuff where they just it was just impossible yeah. for them to like, properly sort of remove all the debris from their EVAs when they got back into the module. Which is one that like, leads perfectly to one of the other problems. It's the, the abrasiveness of the material mm. because it isn't, the particles are really have, have really weird sharp particle shapes mm -hmm. because there's no erosion by wind or water. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they end it because it's so fine. It just penetrates all your mechanisms mm -hmm. and all your seals and your bearings and everything just yeah. stops working after it really probably can't be too good to breathe this kind of material either i wouldn't have thought no it's actually you can actually get minus disease oh really <laughs> yes cool. it's, it's that fine that it penetrates your your lungs to right. the to the finest okay. um, parts mm. so. So do you know what sort of aspect then in your project you're going to be focusing on in terms of uh, um so um, i won't focus on the on the, the dust mitigation, because that's a whole another yeah. um, problem by itself. So mm -hmm. I'm really focusing on the excavation part, um, how we can um, dig up the material with the like as little force as possible, mm -hmm. because that's the other big problem besides the soil parameters is that we are operating in only a sixth of the Earth's gravity. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever you come up with on Earth, on Moon, it will be able to, um, like, it, it will perform a lot worse than it would on on, mm. on earth mm. because um if you have a digger on earth and you want to dig deeper or you want to dig through soil that is dense um yeah you can design your tracks differently or your um or your wheels or whatever mm. but at one point you will have to make it heavier or more mm. powerful yep. to go through it mm. and that's this terrestrial approach it's excavation on earth a lot of times it's just brute force mm. you make it heavy you make it powerful and you will you will go through it. Mm -hmm. But on the moon, um, because launching equipment to the moon is still so expensive, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have to um, really focus on to focus on the reduction of the excavation forces mm -hmm. because that enables us to, to make the, 
the rover or the vehicle smaller, especially in the in the early days of ISRO where we still are right now, yeah. um, where the first robotic missions will be um, small robotic vehicles. Mm -hmm. So my PhD will focus on this: how can we reduce those forces? Um, and I would like to connect it with a beneficiation step. So beneficiation is a is a term um, coming from the terrestrial mining industry, which means basically increasing the quality of a product. Um, so our first step will most likely be uh, particle size separation because for pretty much every ISRU operation we will have um, the deep printing or oxygen extraction um, we will probably need to to sort out two coarse particles or two small particles um, and it's not um, again not as easy as people would think that you just take a sieve and you yeah. do a bit of sieving yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the connection of those two um, steps in the along the process chain is, mm. is will be one focus of my PhD because right now it's two completely separate mm. uh, yeah. research areas. Yeah, I guess um, for for viewers who are not too familiar, this this process of um, <coughs> turning lunar soils into oxygen is quite a fascinating reaction. Mm. Really, it's quite an obscure thing, I think. Really, so I think am I right in thinking it, they use the mineral uh, the mineral ilmenite? which is a titanium oxide and there's some, some weird chemistry that goes on and you end up with water and, and oxygen. There are it? actually three different, um, let's say three different forerunners in the whole mm -hmm. oxygen production. Um, there's hydrogen reduction, carbon thermal reduction and the, the FFC Cambridge process. And um, as you say, there's a lot of magic going on <laughs> in terms of the chemistry. <laughs> oh, it's, um, it's quite neat, really, how you can just basically take rock dust and turn it yes, into something yes. breathable. Um, but if you if you look a bit, bit deeper into the processes, which we won't do, I guess, because yeah. we don't want to bore our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, they have, some of them have, like, there's advantages and disadvantages in terms of mm. um, temperature, mm. especially, because some of them operated carbon thermal uh, reduction is about 1600 degrees Celsius, yeah. which is... It's quite difficult yeah. To, yeah. To, to do on the moon achieve now, in, in, in terms of engineering again. Um, yeah. the, the reaction works on Earth, um, but making making it space ready is Another matter. a big task. Mm -hmm. But it is very neat. If we can produce yeah. oxygen on the moon, we can use it for life support. Mm -hmm. We can also yeah. use it as um, an oxidizer in, yeah. in, in rocket engines. So yeah. That's a critical, uh, critical component, I guess, of human habitation. Yes, mm -hmm. it will be... Mm -hmm. um, I think it will be the first yeah. application before we're talking about 3D printing or mm -hmm. radiation protection with regular stuff yeah. like that. So can I ask you more about this uh, this 3D printing then? Yeah. Sure. So it is the aim to use the regolith as a material to do 3D printing with? Is that? Yes. Okay. It's, so yeah. it all comes down to um, saving mass again. Yeah. Because every kg we don't have to launch from Earth um, saves us a lot of money yeah. and and launch capability for other for other things. Um, so 3D printing in general for the aerospace industry is extremely in the, uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, but if we don't even have to take the the material we 3D print mm -hmm. from, we can save additional mass. Yeah. So if we can just take the regolith which we have in basically unlimited yeah. um, mm -hmm. amounts on the moon, then that would be a a big um, a big step forward yeah. if we can print yeah. spare parts or, or tools even. Yeah. No, it's really cool. Mm. It's really cool. So you're working looking at the regolith. Um, we have obviously collected samples of the regolith from, from the moon, but, you know, they're very carefully protected and what you can do with them is very limited. Mm. So what, what do you use instead to, to study the regolith? That's a really good question, and actually one of the of the bigger problems in engineering. Um, so we only have 380 kgs of actual regolith yeah. that is basically um, not accessible if you want to mm -hmm. do any destructive testing yeah, yeah. or you need larger mm -hmm. amounts. Um, so we use regolith simulants, and it's actually quite a big research area mm -hmm. um, where it started kind of after the first Apollo missions before they introduced the, the, the lunar rover vehicle because they mm -hmm. had to test it. Um, so the first simulants came up, uh, which are, back then they were mostly just for engineering, so relatively like, not, not uh, characterized very well. Mm. Um, but the, the community realized that there's a need for, for well-made and specifically engineered simulants. Um, so by now there's a few look up the history of of simulants there's 
dozens of them. Mm -hmm. um, some of them really well known, others just mentioned somewhere. But the problem is with, with simulants um, that you have to be really careful what, what you want to use them for. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the simulants, they are, they are titled, it's a geotechnical simulant or it's a, um, a scientific simulant to do chemistry on. Mm -hmm. But um, you can't just believe that basically. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really careful because a, if, if, I'm, if I want to do oxygen extraction, I want a simulant that has the same um, chemical composition yeah. as the actual regolith. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if I'm doing engineering work on a on a rover, I don't care so much about the chemical composition, but I I care about the mechanical properties. Yeah. Um, so there's in in the whole area of of um, simulants, there's a bit of I don't I don't really know how to how to say that. Um, a lot of people just take something or, or assume it is made for that yeah. and just mm -hmm. use it yeah. um, but mm -hmm. then afterwards it turns out it's not the yeah. maybe it's not the best um, source to yeah. use so so especially in, in my terms um, dealing with excavation I'm looking at um, large amounts that I need for experiments mm -hmm. so yeah. 100 kgs plus yeah. Um, and that, that would be a bit much to ask for from NASA. Oh yeah, maybe. yeah. Can I have a third of your? <laughs> <laughs> I promise it's, it's it's important. I promise. Yeah. And I, and I'm not destroying it. I can give it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's a there's a need for for kind of low fidelity simulants mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. um, a lot of people end up using sand, for example, example, which is which is fine as a as a low fidelity simulant, but um, we have to give a characterization about the about the properties mm -hmm. um, because otherwise the the research is not comparable mm. at all and mm -hmm. and i would like to obtain uh, specifically made simulants problem with them is because there's so much work going into making them that they are very costly yeah mm -hmm. so a a one kilogram is around 30 pounds okay yeah. um and you need 100 yeah yeah and if i if yeah. i need 100 and yeah. go to my supervisor yeah. Yeah. can i spend uh, my entire I, three and a half yeah. research budget on, can i can yeah. i uh, spend my entire funding yeah. on dirt <laughs> i just want to play with it yeah i just want to i just want to play with it yeah. so um yeah, yeah we need it's not just any dirt it's dirt that's kind of like the one on the moon kind of so, <laughs> like yeah. it yeah, so. that's um, way cooler than yeah. normal though. but, but yeah. the similar and the whole similar research is very interesting mm. um, yeah. because there's uh, i mean it's all based on on the the couple of samples we have mm. mm -hmm. of the extra regolith which were only taken in very specific locations mm -hmm. yeah um so there's a lot of work to be done in that area as well to yeah. make make uh, simulants more accessible um you uh, just quite specific but the you know there's that sticky property to the actual regolith uh, that electrostatic property to yes. it have they managed to get that in the simulants um no no okay no the electro so the stickiness of the regolith is actually yeah. a combination of of two things it's yeah. the weird particle shapes mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so going back to what we said earlier the astronauts tried to brush it off their suits and it just didn't work it actually kind of moved deeper into the fabric yeah. um and the electrostatic charge but there is research going on of um on one hand dust mitigation mm -hmm. but the other hand how can we reproduce the uh the charge on on earth mm -hmm. but it's very early mm -hmm. research yeah so you've been trying to acquire some of your own simulants recently yes um <laughs> there was actually um quite interesting <laughs> you're trying to break into nasa <laughs> yeah no 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 let's let's not uh, air this <laughs> um no so that the problem is that uh, as i said real similar to analog materials are very costly mm. um so you need something that is affordable yeah um but still has some of the of the properties you want so you want um small particle size you want kind of the right density mm. um a bit of cohesion that's one big thing mm -hmm. the the regolith does it is cohesive so mm -hmm. you see um people of uh, pictures of of the apollo astronauts digging trenches and yeah. um, with almost vertical walls and they just stay up yeah, yeah um so yeah you you have to find a material that has those properties and then it still has to be 
it has to be produced in large amounts to acquire mm-hmm. it and be affordable. So um, I had a lot of interesting chats with um, aggregates companies, mm-hmm. basically, um, about about any material they have, kind of. And yeah, ended up to- ended up talking by chance to a um, a guy who actually has a geology degree from Imperial College okay. <laughs> um, and is now running an aggregate company. And they were able to supply me with a material that was um, that actually seems to be quite well suited. Nice. Um, I can give more updates when I <laughs> once I <laughs> characterize yeah, it, yeah, but yeah. it it does look good and and behaves similar mm. um, to the regolith. So if you have a bag, for example, you turn it around, it it just keeps the shape of the corner of yeah. the bag. Um, so that's what we're looking for, and we'll see we'll that's see right. how it works. <laughs> so when's that due to arrive? I actually arrived. Uh, it arrived a couple of weeks ago. My right. first, my first batch. So yeah. 250 kgs um, of of oh, that your material. Batch. Your first batch my is first 250. Is, is your <laughs> office upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> um, my desk does look quite interesting. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I'm actually I'm actually moving into a new lab in the fifth yeah. on the fifth floor. Ooh. So. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I hope the lift's working. <laughs> and it's all going to be in a big sandpit, basically. Mm. Yes, um, I am currently constructing a a big sandbox. It's yeah. amazing, um, a literal sandbox. It is a literal sandbox. Um, and then, have you got plans to put maybe some slides, maybe a little paddling, <laughs> yeah, climbing? Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. we're definitely. I'm definitely <laughs> planning for my graduation to have a bit of a beach party. Luna Beach Party. Yeah. Yeah. Luna do beach a lot party. Of work. Everyone is <laughs> covered in this fine material <laughs> oh, yeah. that digs I into your skin. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the risk. Also, I can't <laughs> breathe. Everyone get mine. The risk assessment for the party will be a bit of a struggle. Um, but the plans are already, yeah. the, the plans are made. Um, yes, uh, so the, the one thing we do, if we, if we talk about lunar excavation um, and talking about those forces, we somehow have to come up with an experiment to mm. um, measure those forces on, on Earth. So what researchers use is um, you build a sandbox, you fill it with your simulant of some type, and then you need some form of, rig or device mm. or experimental center set up to um to measure your your excavation forces in in whatever excavator you you want to mm. um, test yeah so i have a sandbox about one meter long 60 centimeters wide um 20 centimeters deep mm. mm-hmm. and then i have a rig on top which is equipped with um a couple of sensors load cells um actuators to basically push a blade or mm-hmm. whatever you come up with yeah. Yeah. through the soil and see yeah. how much force um, you need, which then in turn can give us a um, an indication of how how much mass our rover vehicle would need on mm. on 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 the moon to yeah. actually go somewhere. And is it simple to incorporate um, the moon's gravity into that? Into the experiment, it's actually it's very difficult okay. because you can't. Actually, you can't really do it. So a lot of yeah. uh, not a lot of people. Uh, some people tried um, to. They call it gravity offload, which always sounds very sounds very fancy if you read yeah. the papers. But yeah. no one really knows <laughs> what, <laughs> what it is. So what yeah. they do ta- is basically they take five, uh, five six of the of the weight of the the rover mm-hmm. by um, suspending it from cables from okay. the roof of their ah. of their lab, um, which yeah simulates the the lunar lunar gravity mm. for the vehicle but the soil the soil is still mm. um, yeah not yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. still under the influence of, of yeah. our um i guess it's probably not too practical to take <clears throat> these kind of things onto uh planes with uh, parabolic trajectories <laughs> you probably <laughs> oh, don't want sound. <laughs> well i mean I swear, the alternative is that you actually suspend every particle by its own <laughs> <piece of fishing. laughs> yeah. so you might find that that's actually easier <laughs> It's, it's going to be a whole another PhD myself coming, <laughs> up, coming up with a string fine enough. To <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we're in Manchester. Maybe you can do something with graphene. Oh uh, yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe, yeah, graphene strings. Uh, that's the one. Yeah, parabolic flights. It's actually it's it's interesting, and I'm, I'm I would be very interesting in doing one. But you definitely can't have an open sand. <laughs> 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 I think if you if you call ESA and and be like, can we have your your zero G plane? And yeah. it might be covered in dust <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. <Yeah. but. laughs> Um, but yeah, that's that's actually one thing we have to keep in mind that whatever yeah. we we simulate on Earth, mm-hmm. it's it's still far away from 
what we're doing on the moon yeah. also that all those you can do some theoretical modeling of, of the excavation forces as well but it's all pretty much it's only predictions mm. yeah um and we we don't have enough for example we we also don't have enough information about the actual parameters of the soil yes yeah, on, yeah. on the moon because mm. um we only have a couple of kgs on earth to yep. do experiments on um the astronauts did some in situ mes- measurements of of uh, geotechnical parameters but it's all yeah in those couple locations yep. and we don't know if that's um, actually true for other locations yeah, exactly. or yeah. how how well the, the the parameters are actually yeah. how well they have been measured so there's definitely a need for more mm-hmm. more sample returns yeah, yeah. more in situ measurements what are some some of these uh, parameters that you're trying to characterize is it like particle size distribution and like shape distribution i, I think or? the the particle size distribution is actually one of the parameters that is quite well characterized mm-hmm. by now um but other um other parameters are for example cohesion or then there are some um, like angles uh, like it's, it's called um friction angle uh, mm-hmm. so there's there's those parameters which have been nasa tried to to analyze them or characterize them while being on the moon but if you look at the the available um, literature they are pretty uniform um over large areas on the moon and that's most likely not not what it actually is yeah, yeah. um so you you read sentence like yeah that's um holds true for inter crater areas and yeah we just don't really know mm. yeah so um so your first plan then with the this regular simulator is to take it and to test essentially what type of pressures you'd need to to dig into it if you were drilling is that correct um not so much drilling okay um it's so drilling is a whole is another thing, <laughs> another yeah, research yeah. area because drilling is um it's a very important yeah. um task for for planetary exploration but it is at least right now it is more about sampling small specimens or okay. something and yeah. we're talking about larger yeah. like larger excavation yeah. operations um, not not as big as you sometimes see on on the media yeah, where yeah. we will have a, a massive bulldozer um <laughs> digging through half of the moon which maybe in the future but <laughs> not in the near future <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah so I'll, I'll i'll push a um a blade or through the soil and see how how the forces behave um and how we can reduce the the force because it's based on how wide your blade is mm. Um, what angle you're digging into the soil, how deep you're cutting into the soil, so all those parameters, and then we can also combine the the, the just physical excavation with, for example, the application of vibration. So if you make your blade vibrate, um, there have been studies that this reduces the force again. Mm. The one thing about the whole excavation research is we can't just build a a miniature version of a of a digger yeah we have to come up with some kind of specific design yeah. mm-hmm. made um to work on the moon yeah so are a lot of um uh, companies taking an interest in this kind of this is quite a, an active field at the moment or is it still needing to generate a lot of momentum to bring this problem to so the forefront? so um the whole issue area is gaining a bit of of speed right mm-hmm. now Good. with yeah. with um like isa having a a mission to go back to the moon yeah. um NASA is planning to go back to the moon in 2024, as we just learned. Yeah. Um, so there is a, a push towards new yeah. technology in terms of companies that are that are not related to space. There's still a bit of, so for example, terrestrial mining companies mm. um, are very are very interesting partners because they have this this wide knowledge base of of how to excavate mm. things, um, but sometimes the engineers or scientists from both sides um are not really talking about the same things yes, at the yeah, same yeah. times because uh we don't necessarily know much about excavation they don't necessarily know much about space yeah so there's a bit of yeah. work necessary to to get them on the same page mm-hmm. but it i think there will be more and more um the the longer we do the whole issue thing and after we have first demonstration missions yeah. and so on, I think there will be more collaboration between. Mm. In the long run, will it be, do you think commercial companies have got a, a big role to play in terms of driving forward human habitation on the moon? Yes, I would say they definitely have to play a part. Um, I'm not, it's, it's a different, really tricky question um, because you see a lot of those um, 
those mining companies, asteroid mining companies yeah. um, popping up. Um, but I would say some of some of them are. It, it's a bit of like a dream. Yeah. yeah. Well, asteroid thing. mining certainly. Yeah. 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 I don't um, think that any of them have thought that through. But I think I think <laughs> the the first the first push of of the whole ISRO um, thing on the moon will be driven by the space agencies. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but. I mean, we saw the, the Israeli lander almost yeah. almost yeah. making it yeah. um, to the moon, and that's that's incredible to achieve something like that with the the amount of funding they yeah. they had. Yeah. Um, the yeah, so I think private companies should should play a role um, because also they can they always can take a bit more risk yeah. um, than the agencies. Yeah. Um, so it has to be a has to be a collaboration between both sides i think but we'll see how it how it develops <laughs> so there's a question we ask uh, all of our guests that we try to at least um is there a particular part of, uh, of science or, or anything in general really that you find fascinating outside of uh, your specific field i think um besides my my um actual engineering field in terms of science it is space related because we're all space people mm-hmm. um i think the the effects of the whole space environment upon upon humans mm-hmm. um is very fascinating mm. you know studies like the the twin the twin astronauts in yeah. um from nasa where they actually found out that the dna changes and um yeah. stuff like that because we we know so little about it yeah, and yeah. it's going to be so important for yeah. for martian missions for example mm. yeah. um it's a really really interesting um aspect of research i think yeah quite a blossoming field i suppose it is very good answer as well yeah Yeah. and it's kind of in the way of all those um visions of sending hundreds of people to the (laughs) mars Mars. yes (laughs) wow (laughs) because there's this bit in between where it's a bit harsh yeah Yeah, absolutely (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a bit harsh I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean, we don't want to keep people from going right yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta sell it yeah you gotta sell it it's really spacious um yeah, yeah. that's it that's the only good thing about it yeah. <laughs> don't even have netflix no it's terrible Gunter, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, it was a fascinating you. chat. Thanks, we'll thanks definitely, for having me. Oh, that's a pleasure. We'll definitely <laughs> want to get you back on uh, in a few years' time after you're a bit more into your project and yeah, you're starting to get some results. And I think we'll be really keen to see what's going on. Happy yeah. to give you an update um, about the sandbox. And, and, and then actually, I'll... once you've got your sandbox up and running, we should come and do some filming. And, um, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Definitely. Yeah, we'll have that party. <laughs> have that beach <laughs> party. Yeah, um, yeah I'll, I'll order the slides. <laughs> 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 no, I'm more than happy to, to show you my, okay. my sandbox and, and my... Um, yeah, my first results. Oh, Fantastic. Well, once again, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. And uh, we'll see you all again next week.